and welcome to Indus News. Live from Islamabad, I'm Naila Shajra and these are the headlines. We start from the United States where the Senate has voted to move forward with former President Donald Trump's impeachment trial, declaring it constitutional. The 100-member chamber voted 56 to 44 with six Republicans joining all 50 members of the Democratic caucus. Trump was impeached by the last House or last month in the charge of inciting insurrection on the United States Capitol on the 6th of January. In Myanmar, protesters have returned to the streets of the capital, Nea Pitwa, after clashes in the anti-coup demonstrations yesterday. Hundreds of government workers marched in support of a civil disobedience campaign that has also been joined by doctors. Meanwhile, the United States and the United Nations have condemned the use of force against the protesters. Palestinian factions Fatah and Hamas have agreed on the mechanisms for upcoming legislative and presidential elections. In a joint statement, 12 Palestinian factions pledged to abide by the timetable for the long-delayed balloting and accept the results. The reconciliation was reached at the end of the two-day session of intra-Palestinian talks in Egypt's capital, Cairo. World Health Organization's data shows the global number of new coronavirus cases has declined for the fourth week in a row. However, Mexico reported 10,000 new cases and more than 1,700 deaths, bringing the toll over 168,000. Pakistan has registered over 1,000 new cases and 62 deaths overnight, taking the tally to 12,128. Globally, the virus has claimed over 2.3 million lives and infected nearly 107 million people. Football Manchester United have beaten West Ham United 1-0 to qualify for the quarterfinals of the FA Cup. Scott McTomney scored United's winner in extra time to send the Red Devils through. United have reached the last eight for the seventh consecutive year as they bid to lift the trophy for the first time since 2016. For more news and details, stay tuned. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. The United States Senate has voted to move forward with former President Donald Trump's impeachment trial. Trump faces a charge of incitement of insurrection over the deadly 6th of January Capitol riot hills. The 100-member chamber voted 56 to 44, largely along the party lines, declaring the trial constitutional. As the proceeding began, House impeachment managers presented a video interspurring images of the Capitol violence with clips of Trump's incendiary speech. Meanwhile, Trump's lawyers termed the proceeding as unconstitutional and partisan effort to close off Trump's political future. Only six Republicans, including Senator Bill Cassidy, joined the Democrats in voting to go ahead with the trial. Democrats hope to disqualify Trump from ever again holding public office. But Tuesday's outcome suggested they faced long odds. I said I'd be an impartial juror. Anyone listening to those arguments, the House managers were focused, they were organized, they relied upon both precedent, the Constitution, and legal scholars. They made a compelling argument. President Trump's team were disorganized. They did everything they could but to talk about the question at hand. And when they talked about it, they kind of glided over it, almost as if they were embarrassed of their arguments. Trump's conviction seems unlikely as the Democrats are well short of two-thirds majority. It is required to indicate the former president in the evenly split 100-seat Senate. 
The United States says it is closely monitoring the border disputes between India and China. At a news briefing, State Department spokesperson Ned Price said Washington supports a direct dialogue between the two sides. Price said that the United States will continue to support a peaceful resolution of the ongoing border disputes. His remarks followed a phone call between Secretary of State Antony Blinken and his Indian counterpart Subramanian Jay Shankar. The State Department said the call's purpose was to reaffirm bilateral relations and discuss the mutual concern. New Delhi and Beijing have been locked in a military standoff over their disputed mountainous border at Ladakh. In Iran, President Hassan Rouhani says Tehran is ready to resume compliance with the 2015 nuclear deal only if the United States fulfills its commitments. At a meeting, Rouhani said no one should expect Iran to take the first step as Tehran has not left the deal. Earlier, Iran's intelligence minister warned Tehran could push for a nuclear weapon if harsh international sanctions remain in place. Mahmoud Alavi reiterated Iran's nuclear program is peaceful, but Tehran could reverse its course if concerned. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden has said Washington will not lift sanctions to get Iran to the negotiation table. In Myanmar, protests have returned to the streets of the capital, Nea Piti, after clashes with the anti-coup demonstrations yesterday. Thousands of people also joined demonstrations in the main city of Yangon. In Nea Piti, hundreds of civil servants and doctors marched in support of a growing civil disobedience campaign. There have been reports of serious injuries as police used water cannons against protesters on Tuesday. The West has voiced strong concern over the violence and rejected the use of force against protesters. Aung San Suu Kyi is under house arrest, while many other NLD officials have also been detained since the 1st of February's military coup. Suu Kyi's party, NLD, says Myanmar's military also raided and destroyed the party's headquarters. Palestinian factions Fatah and Hamas have agreed on the mechanisms for upcoming legislative and presidential elections. In a joint statement, 12 Palestinian factions pledged to abide by the timeline for the long-delayed balloting and accept the results. The factions also agreed to establish an election court based on judges from Jerusalem, the West Bank and Gaza. It said no one other than the Palestinian police will guard the voting sites in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The two sides also agreed to release detainees held on political grounds and allow unrestricted campaigning. The reconciliation was reached at the end of the two-day session of intra-Palestinian talks in Egypt's capital, Cairo. The European Union has called on Israel to stop demolishing Palestinian homes. In a statement, the foreign policy spokesperson said Tel Aviv should facilitate aid to access Palestinian communities instead. They said that the bloc considers Israel's actions illegal and an impediment to viable two-state solution. The spokesperson said Brussels firmly opposes Israel's settlement policies, such as forced transfers, evictions, demolitions and confiscations of homes. They said 60 Palestinians, including 35 children, have been displaced after 46 homes were demolished recently in the Jordan Valley. In Azerbaijan, at least 14 people have died in mine explosions in the Upper Karabakh region since the inking of the truce. Russia brokered the peace agreement between Azerbaijan and Armenia last November after six weeks of war. The prosecutor general's office says 14 citizens, including five Azeri soldiers, were killed by mines planted by the Armenian forces. In a statement, it said 52 soldiers and eight civilians were also injured in the explosions. Civilians have been cautioned from entering the liberated areas until the region is cleared of mines. Turkey has signaled a willingness to compromise with the United States over the Russian S-400 ballistic missile defense system. In an interview, Turkey's defense minister Hulusi Akar said Ankara may refrain from full deployment of the Russian system. Akar said that the defense systems will only be operational in the time of crisis on the basis of Turkey's threat perception. The defense minister also expressed the intent to negotiate with the United States to resolve the issue. However, he said that without resolving the issue of U.S. backing for PKK in Syria, the S-400 issue can't be settled as well. Ankara's purchase of the Russian missile defense battery has put extra strain on U.S.-Turkey relations. 
Russia has called recent comments by the European Union emotional amid the economic crisis and the pandemic. This comes after EU's top diplomat warned Moscow of new sanctions over the jailing of Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. In an interview, Russian lawmaker Vladimir Drabaskovu said that the EU thinks that it can meddle in their internal affairs. Earlier, EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell said his last visit to Moscow had cemented his view that Russia wants to divide the West. He called the government of President Vladimir Putin merciless, authoritarian and afraid of democracy. The United Kingdom approved the sale of arms worth $1.9 billion to Saudi Arabia last year. Official figures show that the sale in July and September 2020 included missiles and bombs. The deal was approved last year after the lifting of a ban on weapons sales in the Gulf country. The United Kingdom's Court of Appeal concluded that there were only isolated incidents of civilian casualties in the Yemen war. However, critics have slammed the move as immoral and akin to putting off profit before Yemeni lives. The campaign against arms trade said that the United Kingdom made weapons played a devastating role in creating a humanitarian crisis crisis in Yemen. French President Emmanuel Macron says he will send his advisor to Beirut this weekend to follow up on the government formation in Lebanon. Local media reported that Patrick Durrell will meet several Lebanese officials during his visit. Macron has proposed a resolution plan for Lebanon, but it has not been adopted yet by the politicians in office. Last month, the French president said he will pay a third visit to Lebanon to speed up the formation of a new government. Meanwhile, Qatar has also said that it is ready to facilitate dialogue between the Lebanese lawmakers. Le Lebanon has yet to not be able to form a new administration since Hassan Daib's government resigned six days after the Beirut explosion last year. The United Nations has sent 60 truckloads of humanitarian aid to Idlib in the northwestern part of Syria. The aid will be distributed to those in need in the region and nearby ruler areas. The trucks carrying supplies pass through the city of Silbul's border gate in Turkey's southern Hatay province. Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in the Syrian civil war and millions more have been displaced since 2011. Idlib falls within the de-escalation zone forged under an agreement between Turkey and Russia. The area has been the subject of multiple ceasefire understandings, which the Assad regime and its allies have frequently violated. The United Nations envoy to Yemen has urged the Houthis to halt their large-scale offensive on the central city of Marib. In a tweet, Martin Griffin said that the rebel attacks threatened diplomats' efforts for peace. The United Nations envoy said that a negotiation political settlement is the only sustainable solution to the conflict. This comes after Griffiths visited Iran to discuss the crisis with Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif and other top officials. Meanwhile, a Houthi court has sentenced 11 Yemeni lawmakers to death in absentia over their support for the government. Earlier, the Yemeni army announced that it had killed or captured dozens of rebels. It's now time for a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. The World Health Organization data shows that the global number of new coronavirus cases has declined for the fourth straight week. Mexico has more than 10,000 new cases and over 1,700 deaths in the last 24 hours. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 2.3 million lives and infected nearly 107 million people. More on the coronavirus in this report. While vaccines have started providing much-needed hope for the world, experts believe that it is going to take years to figure out how COVID-19 emerged. Even as Canada gradually eases curbs, it has further restricted non-essential travel in and out of the country. Over in South America, the vaccination drives have kicked off in the number of states. Vaccine rollouts have also started on Chile's remote South Pacific Easter Island, famous for its distinctive ancient stones. Peru launched its inoculation campaign with China's Sinopharm, while Venezuela is also scheduled to receive the Russian Sputnik V next week. The vaccination we have started today is only a first step in the long road that we are traveling. 
not only us, whole nations around the world to defeat this insidious and invisible enemy that is the pandemic caused by COVID-19. I hope it is only months. We are betting as much as possible that all Peruvians can be vaccinated in the year of the bicentennial of independence. The United Kingdom scientific advisors have designated a new version of the Kent variant with a mutation found in the South African variant as a variant of concern. COVID-19 accounted for the highest proportion of deaths in England and Wales of any week so far during the pandemic. Meanwhile, Greece is also set to impose a total ban on public movement in the Attica region till February 28. Today, the danger is reappearing, not only in the form of thousands of sick and deaths, but with two facts that greatly worry us. On the one hand, the increase of hospitalizations where the health facilities are gradually filling up, and on the other hand, the mutations of the virus that seem to accelerate its transmissibility. We could wait a few more days, but the alarm bells are ringing, and we have learned to act in order to prevent the problem, and not follow behind the problem in order to save lives. Elsewhere. The French Parliament has approved an extension of the state of health emergency in the country until 1st of June. Spain's coronavirus cases have crossed 3 million, making Madrid only the seventh nation to hit this grim milestone. Hungary is set to become the first European Union country to use the Russian Sputnik V vaccine this week. Pakistan has recorded another 62 deaths from COVID-19 overnight, raising the death toll to 12,128. The health ministry has reported 1,072 new infections since yesterday. The ministry says the infections tally has crossed 557,000. It adds over 514,000 people have recovered from the disease so far. The number of active COVID-19 cases in the country has reached 30,512. The ministry says nearly 32,000 tests were conducted during the past 24 hours. Amid exhaustive efforts to rescue the missing mountaineers, Pakistan has assured the Chilean government that it would make all the possible efforts to trace the missing heroes. Foreign Minister Shami Mut Qureshi held a telephony conversation with his Chilean counterpart, Andre Alamand. Qureshi expresses deep concern over the missing team of the mountaineers. Meanwhile, the General Secretary of the Alpine Club of Pakistan, Karad Haidari, says the search operation will continue today. He told Indus News that no search flight was conducted on Tuesday due to harsh weather conditions as hopes for their survival fade. Pakistan's Muhammad Ali Sathpana, John Snorri from Iceland and Yuan Pablo Mor from Chile went missing on Friday after summiting the world's second tallest peak. Meanwhile, all foreign climbers at the K2 base camp have decided to end the winter expeditions considering the harsh weather conditions. The United States says it plans to continue to seek extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange from the United Kingdom to face hacking conspiracy charges. Assange is facing 17 espionage charges, which carry a maximum sentence of 175 years in prison. Talking to reporters, a Justice Department spokesperson, Mark Rimondi, said that Washington will challenge a British judge's ruling that turned down Assange's extradition. In a January 4th ruling, the judge said that it would be oppressive to extradite Assange to the United States based on his mental condition. The judge set Friday as the deadline for the United States to appeal their ruling for forbidding Assange extradition. Meanwhile, Assange supporters have been pressing the Biden administration to drop charges against him. In the United States state of Minnesota, one person has been killed and four others wounded in a shooting at a health clinic northwest of Minneapolis. Officials say three of the injured are in critical condition. Police say a 67-year-old male suspect has been taken into custody. Investigators believe that the suspect acted alone and singled out the clinic over a personal grudge against the facility or its staff. Bomb technicians are investigating several suspicious devices left at the crime scene and at a motel where the suspect was staying. Nathan Zanga, a young Afro-American artist from Seattle, is pushing for justice through his music and protests. The U.S.-born son of immigrants from Congo has been featured in a movie that adds his artistic perspective to the social justice movement. This report has more. If you find out, he, 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 he. 
Zanga has written songs that reflect why he protests, compositions calling for change and telling his story as an Afro-American. Featuring his music, a short film starring Zanga was released online last month. The 13-minute film starring Zanga is titled Enough and opens with the song Truce. Damn. When did we get like this? Seems like every day we add a few more names to the list. The innocent don't stay alive. The children are desensitized. And to be honest, I'm scared I'm the next one that they'll hit. It's pretty much a documentary of me growing up, figuring out who I'm supposed to be or who I want to be, even with the challenges of that the world's been throwing at me. And I don't know, you get to see me grow up from 11 to now and you get to hear my thoughts from where I was at when I wrote Truce and where I'm at now. Zanga says he followed the news between camp activities and learned about the deaths of several fellow Afro-Americans. In his song Truce, the Seattle-based musician says, daily there is a new name on the list and he fears that he will be the next victim. I wrote truce to I wrote truce to try to make a difference and I wrote enough to say that like I f like how, what what else is there for me to do like I feel tired like how much love do I have to give to receive any love back The film also includes another song which he wrote following the death of George Floyd who was killed by a white police officer last year. Nzanga hopes people watch the film and acknowledge how he gave his best to spread a message of love. Sunny day, ain't sitting out riding, I'm going out fighting, I got the whole lot of empathy. In Kyrgyzstan, frozen Arakul Lake has become a sledding arena. Hundreds of holidaymakers take handmade sleds out to enjoy winter sports on this picturesque lake. More details in this report. This is Kyrgyzstan's largest skating rink formed from the frozen waters of the Arakul Glacier. The lake is situated some 3,500 meters above sea level and has become a major tourist attraction. People from across the country take handmade sleds out and enjoy winter sports. <laughs> It was my children's car. My housemates wanted to throw it in the garbage. I asked them not to do it and to modify it instead. I made a sled and it works well. Children like to sled on it, especially younger ones. Its outer look works as a promotion itself. <laughs> According to local officials, Kyrgyzstan travel agencies have arranged weekend tours to the lake from Bishkek and other cities until mid-February. We pitched up a tent to let our guests drink hot tea. My wife and our neighbor work there. We also rent about 20 sleds, which I did with my own hands. Last winter, only those sleds let us live off. This winter, I have bought 40 to 50 skates. I have sons and a daughter, and we are working here all together. Tunukbek Toktumushev, the chairman of the local parliament, says up to 3,000 people come to Arakol on some days. We have 50 centimeter of ice for now. It goes strong. It starts melting from below by the end of February because of the streams from the Karasaz River. They are warmer and speed up the melting of ice from below. There won't be any ice by the end of February as the Kyrgyz Ministry of Emergency ruled that we will restrict to skate on ice. They will come and check the ice and if it is thinner than 18 centimeter, we will restrict skating on it. For the residents of Arakol village, tourism has become an extra source of income as they rent out sleds and skates and sell hot snacks. Some locals say that they earn between 3 to $12 daily during the winter season. The coronavirus pandemic has transformed the lives of millions of people. Some like Amazon boss Jeff Bezos grew richer, while others, including those working in Indonesia's informal sector, were pushed to the brink of poverty. More in this report.
Indonesian single mother Priyanthi bows stiffly like a robot as she and her five-year-old son, their bodies gleaming in silver paint, appeal to passers-by for an occasional coin at a busy intersection outside the capital, Jakarta. They are among a group of people dubbed silver people who use this strategy to draw attention. While struggling to make ends meet after the coronavirus pushed Southeast Asia's largest economy into recession last year. My name is Puryanti. I am 29 years old. I've been working like this for three months to support my two children. It is difficult to find a job and I'm not ashamed to work like this, even though many people insult me. What is important is to find food for my children. I am very grateful to God for this blessing and keeping us healthy. Priyanthi uses homemade paint, a mixture of screen painting powder and cooking oil, to coat their bodies and add a dramatic effect to the robot act. She says the silver paint causes no ill effects. Some give, some don't. Sometimes people give enough, thank God. I'm here as often as I can be. Sometimes after a whole day, from day to night, I only get $3.58. And some days I can get up to $5. Thank God. Government statistics show that Indonesia's poor account for 26.42 million of a population of over 270 million, a number that grew by 1.63 million over the period from September 2019 to March 2020 onset of the pandemic. Shares in Asia-Pacific have risen, riding the wave of positive sentiment created by the winning streak on Wall Street. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index is leading the gains, climbing over 1.5%. Mainland Chinese shares have also added up over 1%, with both the Shanghai Composite and the Shenzhen Component in positive territory. South Korea's Kospi and Australia's ASX 200 have risen over half a percent. The Nikkei 225 in Japan has also edged up fractionally. It's now time to take a look at the weather around the world. For the latest news updates, you can follow us on our social media at Indos.news.